Hello, Namaskar, and welcome to the Bronze Team. My name is Gautam Barsadia, and today we are going to talk about the Battle of Hyderabad. But before I begin, I want to point out that I am not a historian by any means. I do not have a degree in history. I am just an enthusiast. So, if you have any feedback about the reasoning in this video, please feel free to comment in the comment section below. And if you think this video is enjoyable, please give it a like. And if you think it's worth it, do share this video. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start the discussion. The introduction. The full details of the Assamese Mughal conflict is beyond the scope of this short video. I'm only going to talk about the events directly leading up to the battle, followed by the strategies and tactics involved in the battle itself. The Battle of Khoraigarh was fought in the year 1671 between the Mughal Empire and the Ahom Kingdom of Assam. It was the culmination of the last attempt by the Mughals to invade and conquer Assam. The commander in chief of the Mughal expeditionary force was Emperor Aurangzeb's vassal, Raja Ram Singh of Ambe, in present day Jaipur. Raja Ram Singh was the son of Raja Jai Singh who had defeated and captured Shivaji after the siege of Purandar. Ram Singh's great grandfather was Raja Man Singh who had defeated Rana Pratap in the Battle of Haldi Ghati. So yeah, he had quite the bloodline there. The Mughal force under Ram Singh consisted of 30,000 infantry, 18,000 Turkish cavalry, 4,000 Rajput cavalry from Ram Singh's own mansab. 1500 elite Mughal horsemen or Ahadis, 15,000 archers from Koch Bihar, and 500 artillery pieces. Apart from the land forces, Ram Singh also had a sizable river and navy that had ore propelled ships that were equipped with cannons. However, the exact number of ships under his command is not known. Even with this sizable force of 69,000 plus a navy, Ram Singh was not underestimating the difficulties of invading Assam. He knew that each and every invasion attempt before his had met with defeat. So in order to boost the morale of his troops, he requested the Sikh Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur, to accompany him in his campaign. Guru Tegh Bahadur was preaching the Sikh religion in Patna at that time and according to the volume 4 of the book Sikh religion, Guru Tegh Bahadur agreed to accompany Ram Singh in his campaign, saying, God's name is the medicine for all diseases. Guru Nanak shall assist you and you will conquer Assam. The Nawab of Dhaka also contributed 2,000 additional troops to Ram Singh's force, bringing the total land forces under Ram Singh to 71,000. Ram Singh arrived at Rangamati, the frontier outpost of, of the Mughals at that time in February 1669. Okay, now let us look at the Asmi's camp. The Ahom monarch at the time when Ram Singh reached Rangamati was Saolung Supangmung, also known as Swagadeo Sokodos Hingho, with his capital at Gorgaon. The king had appointed Lasit Borfukon as the commander of the force that was to defend against the Mughal invasion. Now, let me talk a bit about the Borfukon rank of the Asmis. A lot of people think that the rank of Borfukon was that of the commander-in-chief of the Ahom forces. But actually that is not the case. As per the Ahom administrative system, the Borfukon was actually the governor of the territories west of Kolyabar and any military threat from that side was to be handled by him unless he was superseded by a different officer under a royal decree. This short video does not give me the luxury to delve deeper into the home ranks and their administrative system. I will try to make a separate video on that soon. Lasit Borbukon was the son of Mumai Tamali Borborua. Mumai Tamali Borborua had risen from the being a bonded servant to the post of Borborua, one of the top five ministers of Patra Montries of the Ahom court. Mumai Tamali had successfully fought and defeated the Mughal forces sent by Emperor Shah Jahan to invade Assam. So Lasit wasn't really lacking in bloodline either. The highest ranking minister in Assam at that time, Aton Buraguhai, also took active part in the campaign against the Mughals. Even though the Ahom territories extended up to the Manok River, Guwahati was the most defensible location and so the Ahom decided to make their last stand there and that is why Aton Buraguhai and Lasit Borfukon had their headquarters for the campaign in Guwahati. I will go into the reasons why Guwahati was a favorable defensive point a little later. For now, let me outline the command structure of the Ahom forces. Now there are no records of the strength of the Ahom forces at that time. Most of the facts that I have mentioned so far are from the Ahom court chronicles or Buranjis. Uh, in case you are wondering, yes, that's where the name of this channel comes from. Even though they contain accurate numbers of the invading army, the Buranjis do not talk about the number of soldiers in the Ahom army under Lasit Borfukon. However, we may be able to gauge the number from the Patshah Namas or Mughal court chronicles. The Patshah Nama refers to the Ahom monarch as the infidel with a thousand elephants and hundred thousand foot soldiers. The insult aside, it does tell us that the entire Ahom army at that time numbered a hundred thousand. Of course, it is highly unlikely that the entire army of hundred thousand would be concentrated on the west, leaving the rest of the country open to attack. So it would be a safe guess to say that about half of that number, 
say about 50,000 was under last seat to thwart the Mughal attack. The Ahom army lacked the cavalry force and so the 50,000 must have consisted of infantry, archers, artillerymen as well as naval forces. The Ahom forces were divided into two contingents, one on the Aton Puragohai station on the north bank and the other on the Lasit Borfukon on the south bank. Although Aton Buragunghai far outranked Lasit, it was Lasit who had the overall command of the Ahom forces at Guwahati. A rough comparison of the two forces. Now let's see how the two forces stacked up against each other. Starting with cavalry, the Assamese forces didn't really have a cavalry force to speak of, probably because horses are not endemic to Assam. The Mughals, on the other hand, were the direct descendants of Timur the Lame, who was famous for using his Turko-Mongol cavalry to wreak havoc across Asia, Northern Africa, and Eastern Europe in the 14th century. Cavalry was especially advantageous for the Mughals as the average Assamese soldier was not familiar with horsemen and didn't know how to counter them. Moving on to infantry now, both the Mughal and Assamese foot soldiers used short swords and matchlock muskets but wore little to no armor at all. So equipment wise they were pretty even. However, we have to keep in mind that the Asmi soldiers of the Ahom Kingdom had successfully repulsed multiple invasion attempts by the Delhi Sultans for more than 150 years by the time the Battle of Haraigat was fought. The Mughal writer Ibn Muhammad Wali Ahmad in his book Tariqi Assam observed that if a single Ahom soldier meets 10 Muhammadan foot soldiers, he will fearlessly fight them and even emerge victorious. Now let's not get carried away by this statement. Even if a person were to be using a modern semi-automatic pistol, it will be difficult for him or her to take out 10 armed men in a melee fight. So obviously there is some exaggeration in this statement. But we can definitely say that the Mughals respected the capabilities of the Ahom soldiers. A good example of the superiority of the Asmi's infantry and also their vulnerability to cavalry charges is the engagement at El Abhoy in August 1667. The Asmi's infantry defeated the initial Mughal infantry charge. But then Mughal cavalry charged their positions and the Asmi's forces were crushed with an estimated 10,000 soldiers dead on the field. Moving on to the artillery, both the forces employed cannons of various calibers. The largest Asmi's cannons were called Mithahulungs. Some of these Mithahulungs fired cannonballs as heavy as 200 pounds. The Mughals had large caliber cannons too. Finally coming to the navy, both the forces had sizable riverine navies but they belonged to two opposing schools of thought. While the Mughal war sloops were quite large with an average length of 150 feet carrying 16 to 20 cannons, the Asmi sloops were only 60 feet in length and carried half the number of cannons. But in the trade-off they were much more maneuverable. The average Asmi's of those days was quite used to navigating rivers with boats. In fact, as per the book A History of Assam by Sir Edward Gate, the river traffic was so great that a Guwahati official reported 32,000 boats of various kinds passing by in the month of Ramzan of 1662. And Guwahati wasn't even the economic center of Assam in those days. The Mughal war sloops were mostly manned by Dutch and Portuguese mercenaries who were more accustomed to fighting on sail-powered vessels in the high seas. There are no records of a riverine navy in medieval Europe. So they were therefore not used to overpowered sloops and navigating varying currents especially in a river like the Brahmaputra. The Assamese therefore had a clear advantage here. The Strategic Importance of Guwahati I had earlier mentioned that Guwahati was an ideal defensive location for the Assamese. To understand that better, let's look at this Google map of present-day Assam. At that time, the Ahom territories extended up to the Manok River, but the terrain between the Manok River and Guwahati being quite flat was unsuitable for defending against a numerically superior army with a strong cavalry. So the Ahom strategically retreated to Guwahati, allowing the Mughal forces to take the country west of Guwahati without any major engagements. So Ram Singh came up to the edge of Guwahati and encamped at Hualgusi on the north bank of the Brahmaputra. Now if you look at Guwahati, it is on the bank of the Brahmaputra and has hills on both sides of the river. The Ahoms built earthen forts to link these hills into a continuous defensive chain that allowed the Ahom artillery to fire into the advancing Mughal forces. Thus the Mughal land forces could effectively be stopped at the hills. The only way into Guwahati and beyond left for the Mughals would be to attempt to defeat the Ahom navy and breach the defenses of Guwahati through the Brahmaputra. The Brahmaputra, as we can see, is at its narrowest at Guwahati which means that the current would be the strongest at Guwahati due to throttling effects and in attacking Guwahati, the Mughal navy would have to travel upstream against this current which would make the attack much slower. The Mughals could of course bypass the fortifications of Guwahati and try to invade Assam through the north bank of the Brahmaputra 
but that would expose their flanks to an attack from Guwahati and if they were to push further inland, they would have run the risk of getting their supply lines severed which would have effectively trapped them. But as it turned out, realizing that it would be difficult to take Guwahati head on, Ram Singh did at first try to bypass Guwahati through Dorong. They were however defeated in a series of engagements and were forced to retreat to Kualkusi and concentrate their efforts in taking Guwahati from the front. And that's what led to the Battle of Horaighat. There is one point that needs to be mentioned here before we actually get into the technicalities of the battle. It is believed by a lot of people that the Mughal attempts of invading Assam had failed repeatedly because Assam is a hilly place and the Mughal forces were not accustomed to fighting in hills. Let me give you a little perspective on that. I agree that I just showed Guwahati to be bordered by hills on both sides of the Brahmaputra. But let us now look at Ram Singh's territories. Ram Singh's home, the Ambe Fort is itself atop a hill and is surrounded by other hills that are as tall as 700 feet. Also, the Chittorgarh fort which belonged to Rana Pratap's ancestors and which was earlier captured by Ram Singh's great-grandfather Raja Man Singh stands on a hill that is 590 feet high. In contrast, one of the tallest hills around Guwahati, the Nilasol Pahar on which the Kamakya temple is situated, is 562 feet in height. So the Rajput soldiers were definitely accustomed to fighting on hills that were as tall as the ones around Guwahati. The Mughals on the other hand had come from the Fergana Valley of present-day Uzbekistan which is much more mountainous than Assam and so they too were definitely familiar with fighting on hilly terrains. What I am getting at here is that it wasn't just the presence of the hills that made it difficult for the Mughals to enter Guwahati but rather the way these hills were fortified that made Guwahati impenetrable for the Mughals. The currently accepted narrative of the Battle of Horaighat I will try to recreate the battlefield here. As already discussed, the Brahmaputra is bordered on both sides by hills. This is the Nilasol hill and this is the Itakuli hill. Lasit Borpukon had his offices in a fort atop Itakuli hill which gave him a view of the whole battlefield. The Ahoms built earthen forts to link the hills into a continuous defensive chain. It is said that Lasit put so much importance in the proper construction of the earthen forts that he even beheaded his maternal uncle who was in charge of the construction for dereliction of duty. However, I should mention here that there is no written record of Lasit beheading his uncle. This story is only found in the folklore of Assam. This area is Oswakranto and this part is the Andherubali sandbank. Andherubali being sandy is suitable for landing cavalry onto the shore of the river and so it was guarded by defences. I will now outline the course of the battle as recorded in the Ahum Buranjis and taken from the narrative of the battle in Hujjo Kumar Bhuya's book Aton Bura Guha and his times. Around March of 1671, the Mughals came to know that Lasit Borfukon was seriously ill and that consequently the morale of the Ahum forces was quite low. Around that time, the Mughal ambassador Pandit Rai visited the Ahum camp to deliver a message and on returning, he reported a breach in the defenses of the Andherubali sandbank. Ram Singh received fresh reinforcements in the form of additional war sloops commanded by the Mughal admiral Munawar Khan and realizing that he had to enter Guwahati through the Brahmaputra, he decided to make best use of this opportunity. The Mughals loaded their cavalry and some of their foot soldiers on their boats and attacked the Assamese naval forces. At the same time, the remainder of the land forces on the north bank made an all-out attempt at breaching the Ahum land defenses near Oswakanto. The Mughal land forces were confronted by the Ahom land forces under Lasit Borfukon's elder brother Nimati, also known as Lalu Kula, who at that time was a Naubai Safukon or a commander of the Ahom marine forces. This Lalu Kula later became a Borfukon after Lasit and was known as Lalu Kula Borfukon. Lalu Kula's forces were able to block and defeat the Mughal land forces. But when the Mughal naval forces attacked the Ahom warboats, they were not able to sustain the Mughal attack and retreated. Seeing this, Ram Singh and his admiral Munawar Khan gave the order for an all-out naval assault and loaded further Mughal forces on their war sloops and attacked the retreating Ahom boats, supplementing the Mughal boats that were already in the attack. The Ahom navy at this time was in a flight trying to run away from the Mughal boats. Lasit was overseeing all this from his sickbed atop Itakuli hill. When he saw the Ahom navy retreating hastily, he had himself taken to his own war boat and together with a few other boats he rushed towards the thick of the battle. Seeing their commander himself taking the field despite his illness, the Ahom navy found renewed strength and vigor. They immediately turned back and advanced towards the Mughal forces. This now advancing Ahom navy constructed a bridge of boats across the Brahmaputra. This bridge of boats served to block the Mughal advances as well as help move some of the Ahom forces from the north bank where they were concentrated in larger numbers to the south bank so that they could move to the Andherubali sandbank before the Mughals could land there. 
Now the region where the fighting took place was like a triangle with Ashwakranta, Itakhuli Hill and Andherubali forming the vertices. The Mughals were unable to sustain the well-directed attacks of the Ahom Navy and Army. Their Admiral Munawar Khan was shot on his warboat and the Mughal Navy was crushed and many of their boats sank taking their soldiers and cavalry down with them. The Ahoms pursued the Mughals and drove them out of Ahom territories to the other side of the Manok River killing a large number of Mughal soldiers in the process. Lasit Borfukhan died a year after the battle in April 1672, but he did not die from the disease at Khoraigat, but a different disease altogether. Peculiarities in the currently accepted narrative This video is named a fresh look at the battle of Khoraigat and it is now that we have arrived at the part of the video that is actually fresh. I am now going to point out a few peculiarities in the current accepted narrative of the Battle of Khoraigat and then I will put forward my own reasoning as to how the battle might have actually taken place. The Mughal ambassador reported a breach in the defenses of the Andherubali sandbank while returning from a meeting with Lasit. Think about it carefully. Can anyone be that stupid to allow an enemy ambassador to see their weakness when they knew that he was going to come? The Mughal all-out land attack on the north bank was repelled. Does that look like the work of a demoralized army? The Ahom navy constructed a bridge of boats. Think about it. A fleeing navy turns around to form a bridge of boats. The Brahmaputra, even though at its narrowest at that point, is about a kilometer wide. There were no cell phones at that time, so how would each boat know its position in the bridge of boats? This is simply impossible unless the move was premeditated. The Mughals could not sustain the well-directed Ahom attack. What is meant by a well-directed Ahom attack? That all or most of the Ahom shells or cannonballs fired found their mark. That can only happen if the Ahom artillerymen knew where the Mughal naval forces would be blockaded and had already pre-ranged their cannons. And the final peculiarity is that Lassit died a year later but from an entirely different disease. We have to understand that the Burundis were not written as the events progressed but were written much later by collecting information from various sources. So it is quite possible that because Lassi died a year later from a disease, the chroniclers having themselves not being present at the battle thought that Lassi was ill during the battle as well. So now, keeping these new points in mind, if we reconstruct what actually happened, we will see the real military genius of Lassi Borfukov. How the battle might have actually taken place The Ahom spread the rumor that Lasit was seriously ill and that the army was demoralized because of it. When the Mughal ambassador came to meet Lasit Borfukhan, he was further confirmed of Lasit's illness. While he was returning, the defenses of the Andherubali sandbank were shown to be in disrepair. The ambassador reported this to Ram Singh, who then decided to make an attempt to land his cavalry on the Andherubali bank using his navy as hoped by Lasit. The Ahom army blocked the Mughal land forces on the north bank, but the Ahom navy retreated after a faint encounter with the Mughal forces. They were able to use their more maneuverable boats to get away from the Mughal forces. This lured the Mughal forces further into Ahom territory and they also committed the rest of their forces to this naval assault as hoped by Lassi. Now as the Mughal navy was advancing towards the Itakhuli fort in the heart of the Ahom defenses, Lasit himself joined the fight and taking this as a cue, the Ahom ships turned back towards the Mughals and again, utilizing their more maneuverable boats, took their predetermined positions in the bridge of boats. The extra Ahom soldiers from the north bank now moved across the bridge of boats to the south bank and occupied Andherubali before the Mughals could land there. Now in one neat stroke, the Mughals were surrounded from three sides. The Burundis say that the fighting took place in a triangle, but that doesn't mean anything. What the Burundis were trying to say probably was that the Mughals were now surrounded and attacked from three sides. This error probably occurred while translating the Burundis from the Thai language of the Ahom court of that time to present day Assamese. The trapped Mughals were then attacked with a concentrated barrage of cannonballs and musket fire. Many Mughal warboats sank taking their horses and soldiers down with them. The remaining vessels along with Ram Singh fled westwards, closely pursued by the Ahoms who killed many in the process. The battlefield tactic employed by Lassi. Now I would like to draw attention to the tactic employed by Lassi Borfukon. The tactic that Lassi employed is called a double envelopment. 
One who employs this tactic tries to draw the enemy into the center of his battle formations and then has his flanks or sides move up and encircle the enemy by attacking its flanks, forcing the enemy to retreat or be destroyed. The way Lassit employed this tactic was that he first drew the Mughal navy along with their cavalry into the center of the Ahom defenses through the Brahmaputra and then, using the bridge of boats, he had half of his soldiers transferred from the north bank to the south bank and completed the envelopment. The Mughal forces were now attacked from three sides. In addition to that, the area which the Mughal navy now occupied was pre-ranged by the Ahom artillery and it was this well-directed attack by the Ahom artillery which decimated the Mughal forces. The same tactic of double envelopment was famously employed by the legendary Carthaginian general Hannibal to defeat the numerically superior Roman army in the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC. There is however a significant difference in how the tactics were employed by Hannibal and Lassit. Hannibal employed this tactic on land using only his land forces. But Lassit, as we now know, executed this maneuver both on land and water utilizing elements of both his army and his navy. This is something immensely difficult. It speaks volumes about the discipline and level of coordination of the Ahom forces. In fact, the double envelopment tactic utilizing both land and naval elements has never been executed by anyone anywhere in the world. This alone puts Lassit Borfukon in the ranks of the greatest military strategists of all time. So there you go. That's Buronji TV's fresh look at the Battle of Horaikat. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it and also share the video if you think it's worth it. Thank you.